Thank you. Please be seated. All right, thank you. We will go back on the record this morning, KCR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We are in jury trial at this time. The state continues with its case in chief. Um, the court was advised that due to some unforeseen circumstances, the state was requesting a modification of some of the trial schedule relating to today as well as Monday. Is that correct, Mr. Wood? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So as I understand it, the state may have an issue where they'll need to uh, end early today as well as uh, a request that we not hold trial this coming Monday. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Have you discussed that uh, potential change of the schedule with the defense? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Thomas or Mr. Archibald, is there any response to that? request to modify our trial schedule? Your Honor, we understand the circumstances. We have no objection. All right. Uh, based on that, the court will modify our trial schedule accordingly. So we'll get through what we can today uh, with the state's case in chief. And we'll plan on also uh, not holding court this coming Monday. I'll advise the jurors of that at some point as well when appropriate. Yeah, are there any other matters we need to bring up before we continue with evidence this morning, Mr. Wood? Not from the state. From the defense? Okay, and the court will note that the parties are all here present and the defendant as well. Um, I apologize, I should have checked before, but in terms of our jurors, have they all reported this morning and signed their affirmation? <coughs> Very well. Thank you. At this time, then, if we could please have the jurors brought in.
All right. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right. The court notes that the jurors are all present and properly seated this morning. We've received the affirmation. I continue to extend my appreciation and thanks to the jurors for following those admonitions each day as we go through this trial. When we concluded trial yesterday, Detective Hermosillo was on the stand still and cross-examination with Mr. Thomas. So I'll remind the witness you are still under oath. And Mr. Thomas, if you'd like to continue with your cross, you can. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Detective. So yesterday we left off talking about the dig on June the 9th. And you indicated that you were brought from the fire pit over to the pet cemetery. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you indicated that there were, well, I don't know that you indicated, I guess I should ask. How many people were with you when you were digging at the pet cemetery? How many other people were digging with you? I believe you said that you were having to switch out every couple minutes. There we go. That's correct. So how many people were you switching off with? I couldn't tell you the number of people. Okay. Do you know any of the names? I remember Detective Dave Hope. I remember Detective Dave Stubbs. I remember Lieutenant Colin Erickson. That's the only names I can remember. Okay. And those are guys that you've worked with for a while? That's correct. Okay. So I assume there are some people from the ERT team, from the FBI ERT team there as well? Yes, sir. Okay. And you indicated that it was a slow and methodical type of a situation. How long did that take before you pulled out the green bucket from when you started from the top, if you can remember? Well, we started late afternoon. Well, I shouldn't say late afternoon. Early afternoon on June 9th. We didn't get everything out of the ground until afternoon of June 10th. Okay. So what did you do between, I believe, I thought you said that you started digging in the fire pit or sifting in the fire pit around 830. Is that right? Does that sound right? On June 9th. Okay. And then you switched over about a half an hour later to the pet cemetery, right? Correct. Okay. So what did you do between, say, 9 o'clock and early afternoon? Let me back up. I didn't switch over to the pet cemetery. I switched over to JJ's burial site, which was under the tree. JJ's burial site. Okay. And then you did that between 9 a.m. and when? JJ's burial site? Yes. 9 a.m. until probably 1 p.m. Okay. And that's when you switched over to the pet cemetery? After JJ was removed from the ground, I went to the morgue. Okay. And then I came back, and that's when I went to the pet cemetery area. Gotcha. All right. 
And so when you left with, uh, <clears throat> who, who was it that you went to the morgue with? You went with Brenda Dye, right? She was there. She was in a vehicle in front of me, and my vehicle was Lieutenant Ron Ball. Ron Ball. And how long did you guys stay at the morgue? Fifteen minutes. So it was just a check-in, turn the body over, then you left and went back? Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm not sure if you – I was a little bit confused about uh, something. You said, I believe on direct examination with the prosecuting attorney, that you had found uh, some teeth and some bones at the fire pit. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and that was when you first started at, at 9 – or when you first started at 9 a.m. In the, in the fire pit area, or was that later on? Uh, the first day on the ninth or the second day? No, I believe it was the first day when we started sifting through the dirt and debris from the fire pit is when we located those. Okay. And where, you know, as we, we talked about, the fire pit being a very large area, uh, where in relation to that ring of where the fire pit was, the, the actual fire pit area, uh, where in relation to that was the, were the uh, teeth and the bones found? I don't recall. Were you the one that recovered them? Uh, no, sir. Who was, the, who was the one that recovered those? I don't recall who exactly it was that recovered them. Okay, how did you come to the knowledge that there were some that were found? Because I was there on scene. Okay. But you don't know who, who found them and you don't know when they, when they were found? No, sir. I believe you said that you left on June the 10th to go to Ada County. Uh, about what time did you leave uh, Fremont County? Roughly 3 in the afternoon. Okay. And then when you got to Ada County, I'm assuming it was after normal business hours, after 5 o'clock. And so um, how does it work when you uh, drop a, a, a body off at the coroner's office? We called. They knew we were on our way. Uh, there's a bay that we pull into. Uh, they had one of their employees meet us at the bay. He then took custody of J.J., and tie Lee out of the back of the coroner's vehicle, and they were left there in the custody of Ada County Coroner. Okay. And do you specifically recall who this particular individual was that was working at the Ada County Coroner's office? I don't recall a name, no. Okay. I'm sure there's paperwork on it. Okay. Did you uh, recall seeing him the next day at the autopsy? No, he was not at the autopsy the next day. Okay, so it wouldn't have been one of the people listed on the whiteboard. That's correct. Okay. I want to jump back a little bit um, to JJ's uh, burial site. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as uh, State's Exhibit 10H. <clears throat> So the, this is a photograph of, of the burial spot where the rocks had been removed already, right? That's correct. Okay. And these are the boards that 
that were recovered? That's correct. Okay. Did you ever look or try to try to see where these boards might match in the in this house? Did you find anything in the garage or in the barn area or anywhere else on the property? We did. And was there anything that uh, came up came of that? There were boards that were similar, uh, similar to the style, similar to the thickness, um, but we were never able to match, uh, if you will, the sister board to the boards that we located. Okay. And where did you locate those boards? Uh, in the in Chad Daybell's uh, garage area, just on his property, the red garage area. Okay. And were you a part of that actual search? I was a part of the search, yes. Okay. Uh, and you were one of the ones that were trying to match these boards up? Uh, I personally didn't try to match the boards up. We were all part of the search looking for boards similar. Okay. And when you say all, you mean everybody on the everybody that was on the property that day? Not everybody, but a lot of people. Okay. Anybody in particular that you remember? No, sir. When you searched the apartment uh, of Lori Vallow or of uh, Alex Cox or of uh, Melanie Bedreau, Melanie Pulowski, uh you didn't find any boards that matched, that even looked similar to any of those boards, right? We weren't looking for boards at that time. That was The search was November 27th, 2019. Yeah. We didn't search Mr. Daybell's property until June of 2020. Okay. Did you find any boards, uh, anything in your search uh, on uh, when you searched the, 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 the apartments on November 26th? Anything, anything popping out into your mind? Any spare wood laying around or anything like that? Sir, we weren't looking for boards at that time, so I, I wouldn't have been drawn to any boards. They, they wouldn't have meant anything at that time. Did you take photographs? Were there photographs taken of those searches? There were. Okay. You've studied those photographs, right? Uh, yes. Okay. I mean, it's part of your investigation. You're, you're, you're the lead, uh, uh, investigator for this, for this team today, right? That's correct. All right. So that would have been part of your job is to study those photos, be there on scene. Nothing came out, uh, that looked like there were any boards or anything like that in the, in that search or in, the, in any of those photographs? I don't recall any boards in any of the photographs. Okay. And you did a thorough search of those apartments? For the children? You did a ser thorough search of the apartments, right? You photographed a lot of stuff. Correct. Okay. Jumping back to the autopsy, you indicate that you were you were there when uh, JJ's autopsy was done. Uh, was there any trace evidence collected on that particular day on June 11th from the autopsy? I we stood in the back. Um, the medical examiner didn't let us get too up close. With uh, he had his team working around JJ. So I wasn't directly involved with the autopsy, so I can't answer to that. I just observed. Okay. At any time later after the autopsy was done, did you take trace evidence off of J.J.'s body? I did not, know personally. Okay. Do you know anybody who did? I do not know personally anybody that did. Okay. Thank you. No further questions, Ryan. All right. Mr. Wood, does the state have any redirect? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, Your Honor. You can. Uh, Detective Hermosillo, uh, 
on cross, uh, you were asked about the uh, weapons that were found in in the garage of apartment 175, correct? Correct. And if you had any knowledge that they belonged to Lori Dayville? I do not have any knowledge that they belonged to Lori, no. Right. Uh, so why did you take pictures of those items that day? A couple reasons. Uh, one, it was extremely suspicious to have those guns along with everything else we located. Um, we took photographs because uh, and and took the guns out of the residence because when we went inside the residence, the door was broken. It was unable to lock. Uh, so we took photographs of the weapons and held on to the weapons for safekeeping at that point. Okay. And so at the time, why was that? Why were those weapons suspicious? That's the word you used. Can you clarify that? At the time, we knew that there was an attempted homicide uh, in Gilbert, Arizona on October 2nd of Brandon Boudreau. Uh, we also realized uh, through our investigation that there was an attempted homicide or an attempted shooting at Tammy Daybell on October 9th. Uh, and that's why the uh, weapons were photographed. Okay. And they were seized, correct? Correct. And now, uh, in light of all the evidence you're aware of, why are those things relevant? Why are those weapons relevant? Because we're unsure whether those weapons were uh, possibly used in those crimes. Did you, you stated earlier you had no reason to believe they were Lori's. Did, at the time, did you have uh, a reason to believe who they belonged to? No. Okay. Uh, defense counsel asked you about uh, the steps you took to obtain a search warrant, correct? For which warrant? Well, let's talk about that. Let's go back to uh, the morning of November 25th. Okay. Uh, that was the day, and correct me if I'm wrong, was it November 25th that uh, law enforcement first made contact with Lori Vallow? That was November 26th. November 26th, thank you. And uh, defense counsel asked you about a conversation that led you to take steps to get a warrant. <clears throat> correct. Okay. Now... Just, just to clarify, so that uh, everybody understands, after you, when you made contact with uh, Chad Daybell and Alex Cox, who did you call? Lieutenant Ron Ball. Okay. And uh, what did you do after Lieutenant Ron Ball uh, arrived on scene? We went back to apartment 175. Uh, knocked on the door. There was no answer. Uh, we also went to 174, which was Melanie Boudreaux's apartment. Knocked on the door. There was no answer. Uh, there was also no answer at apartment 107. Uh, okay. And so at that point, what did you do? At that point, we attempted to call Lori Vallow, uh, from a cell phone number that Chad Daybell finally provided to us. Um, there was also no answer on the cell phone. So at that time, we drove to the prosecutor's office to see if we needed to obtain a warrant. Okay, and who is we? Who are you talking about? <clears throat> Myself and Detective Dave Hope. And did you obtain a warrant on November 26th? No, we did not. How come? We were able to make contact with Lori Vallow. Uh, and she was instructed to open the front door uh, that there were detectives outside that wanted to speak with her. Okay. And to your knowledge, did she speak with them? She did. Okay. Now, yesterday, defense counsel asked you about a conversation that led you to take steps to get a warrant, correct? 
Correct. Uh, and you mentioned a Melanie Gibb, correct? <laughs> That's correct. Um, who? Uh, how, what was the conversation that led you to contacting Melanie Gibb? When Lori Vallow was contacted by Lieutenant Ron Ball and Detective Dave Stubbs, uh, she stated that J.J. Vallow was with uh, Melanie Gibb in Arizona. Uh, immediately, we attempted to call Melanie, uh, and she didn't answer the phone. Uh, they went back to the residence, made contact again with Lori Vallow, and she stated that J.J., wanted to go see a movie, Frozen 2, and that Melanie Gibb had taken J.J. to the movie to see Frozen 2, so that's why they weren't answering the cell phone. Okay. And to your knowledge, were you, able, uh, were you or other law enforcement able to get into contact with Melanie Gibb eventually? Yes, we were. Okay. Um, and did she have J.J.? No, she did not. And is that what led you to get a warrant the next day? That's correct. Thank you. All right. Defense counsel asked you yesterday about all the tips you received. Correct? Yes, sir. Correct. Tell us a little more about the process you had set up to receive tips at the Rexburg Police Department. We had a hotline uh, through Nick Mick, through the FBI, and through the Rexburg Police Department. And so when tips would come in to the Rexburg Police Department itself, we would have a what's called a tip sheet. And we would have the number of the tip, um, who, who called the tip in, Sometimes they remained anonymous. Sometimes they left their name and phone number. And just a brief description of what the tip was. At that time, it was assigned to an officer or detective to follow up with that individual tip uh, and either confirm or deny the sighting or whereabouts based on the information on that tip. Okay. Um and as I understood it, yesterday defense counsel essentially said you didn't follow up on every tip, correct? Correct. Okay. Let's talk about uh, uh, some different examples uh, of, of those tips. Uh, once you received a tip, what was your you would attempt to contact the person, correct? Correct. Uh, were there individuals who you were able to get in contact with? There were. Did some people send you pictures? They did. Were you ever, ever able to match those pictures with pictures of Tylee and JJ? No. Okay. Um, were some of those tips from psychics? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you have, um, was, were there any occasions where people would call and leave a tip and you would try to contact them and they would not respond? Yes, there were. Okay. Uh, but you did try to reach out to every single one of those people, correct? Yes. Okay. So you followed up on every tip? That's correct. Okay. Uh, defense counsel asked you uh, yesterday about, about a body cam. They asked if you were wearing a body cam. Correct. Correct. Uh, and you responded that you weren't. Correct. Uh, as a detective, do you normally wear a body cam? No, sir. Uh, when you were on patrol, did you normally wear a body cam? Absolutely. When when we were on patrol, we were assigned a, a body cam. Uh, when I went over to the detective division, it's very rare that we may make field contacts or we're the first people on scene. It's usually patrol. Uh, so a lot of our contacts and interviews are in a more controlled environment at the police department, and a vast majority of those are recorded at the police department. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the 
defense counsel asked you about sifting through the fire pit. Can you describe the process of how you sifted and another sifted through the fire pit? The evidence recovery team, FBI evidence recovery team, brought a sifter with them. We would have one person scoop a shovel full of dirt, place it into the sifter. Underneath the sifter there was a tarp. And so we would shake the sifter, sift through the dirt, and any material that was too big to go through the sifter was examined. Occasionally we would get rocks and different things, but there were many times that we got teeth, charred bone, little burnt pieces of flesh that were still there. So that was the process. We would call over an ERT member who was in charge of photographs if there was something that was in the sifter. We wouldn't touch it. We would call over a photographer. They would take pictures of it, log it down, and take it into evidence. Once that was completed, we would go back to sifting. The defense counsel asked you about kind of the timeline of the search on the Daybell property. Correct? Correct. So just to clarify that again, approximately what time did you show up at the residence? Approximately 7 in the morning on June 9th. And other members of the search team were staged? Correct. Down the road at the Sugar Salem Church? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you recall approximately what time they showed up? Probably 7.20, 7.30 in the morning. Okay. You testified yesterday about serving the warrant on Chad Daybell? Yes, sir. And you testified about observing him in front of his house sitting in a car? Correct. Approximately what time was that? Approximately between 8 and 8.30 maybe. Okay. And you observed him, to your perception, looking over his shoulder? Yes. You testified, correct, that he was on the phone? Correct. Okay. Going back to those tips really quick, you said you followed up on every one, or the police did. Were any of them credible? No. Meaning, and let me re-ask that, I apologize, did any of them aid in finding J.J. or Tylee? No. Okay. Have you ever, since June 9th, or let me rephrase that, at any time in your investigation, have you found any evidence to suggest that J.J. was alive after September 22nd or 23rd? No, sir. Similarly, at any time in your investigation, have you found any evidence to suggest that Tylee was alive after September 8th or 9th, 2020? Of 2019. 2019, I apologize, thank you. Not after September 8th or 9th of 2019, no. Okay. Defense counsel asked you this morning about 
the search of Lori's apartment or Miss Miss Validate Bell's apartment, correct? Correct. <laughs> um, at that point, was it a homicide investigation? No, sir. Uh, were you? What were you looking for? We were looking for J.J. Vallow at that point. Okay. <laughs> Your Honor, I have no further questions at this time. Your Honor, I apologize. May I recross there? Just one item, and I know this is, uh, I don't want to get into a, uh, a thing where we're going back and forth, back and forth, but there is one thing I'd like to ask him real quick. All out limited recross. Mr. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Detective, um, you indicated on uh, redirect examination that there was an attempted homicide on October the 9th, 2019. You specifically used those words, attempted homicide. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, there's no evidence of an attempted homicide on October the 9th, correct? We believe there was an attempted homicide on October the 9th, 2019. Okay. Uh, let, me just, let me just back up a little bit here. So on, on October the 9th, Tammy Daybell said that she uh, was confronted with someone who she thought had a paintball gun, correct? Correct. And she said that someone had shot a paintball gun in her direction, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And um, you never found any bullets, any bullet holes, anything like that uh, when you investigated the October 9th uh, uh, attempted paintball shooting? I personally didn't investigate it. It happened in Fremont County, so that would be a Fremont County Sheriff's Office. Okay. That would have done that. But you're, you're the case agent here today. And you've reviewed all that information, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you. All right. That'll conclude the testimony then of the detective. As the case agent, you're allowed to remain in, so uh, you can go ahead and step down. Thank you for your testimony today and yesterday. All right, the state can call its next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state will call Lieutenant Jared Wilmore. And Your Honor, Spencer Rammel for the state on this witness. All right, thank you, Mr. Rammel. All right, Lieutenant Wilmore, uh, as we get started here, I'll just remind you we're keeping a stenographic record of these proceedings, so please use verbal responses such as yes or no. Please try to avoid talking at the same time as any lawyer questioning you so the record remains clear. With that in mind, Mr. Rammel, you can inquire. Thank you, Judge. Lieutenant, can I have you state your name and spell your last name for the record, please? Uh, Jared Wilmore. W-I-L-L-M-O-R-E. Lieutenant, where are you employed? Uh, Madison County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed in that capacity? Uh, it'll be 20 years this year. And how long have you worked in law enforcement? Uh, it'll be close to 20 years. Okay. And are you post-certified? Yes. What are your current assignment and responsibilities? Um, currently, I'm the captain over the Madison County Jail and, and manage that facility. 
As a part of your current responsibilities, do you oversee the Madison County Jail Telmate system? Yes. Can you explain what that system is and how it works? Uh, our, the Telmate system is an inmate phone system. Um, they can do video visitations, phone calls, messages. And so people who are in custody can talk to their family and friends on the on the outside. And how long have you overseen Telmate in Madison County? Um, the last six years. And does that include the Telmate system? Does that include both telephone calls and video visits? Yes. When a video call is made or taken by an inmate, is the camera always utilized? Not always. It depends if the, if an inmate removes the tablet from the charging station, the camera function will will go black, and then it just becomes an audio call. Lieutenant, how do you ensure that inmates do not place calls or visit video visits on behalf of other inmates? Uh, each inmate has a unique PIN number assigned to them, so they have to enter in their their PIN number. It's also, there's facial recognition for the tablet vid video visits, and um, and it's managed and, and re reviewed by deputies to make sure that that's not happening. Whenever an inmate places a call or participates in a video visit, is any information recorded or stored regarding that call or visit? Yes, any, anything on the Telmate system is recorded with the exception of attorney phone calls or, or visitations. That's, those are privileged, so they're not recorded, but everything else is recorded. Lieutenant, is the second or outside party participating in that call, is that individual required to provide name and some personal information? Yes. And as the individual who oversees this system, how do you access the information that is stored? Um, so I have a, a username and password to access the system. And then once into the system, I can go in and, and review any video visits or phone calls under any specific inmate listed that we have in custody. And do you have the ability to edit or make changes to any of this information? No. Where are the phones and tablets uh, that the inmates can utilize? Where are those located in the jail? Um, in our jail, we have a day room, a pod, we call it. Um, and so in that day room, they are located in just that open day room area, and an inmate can access the phones, the tablets. Um, again, the tablets can be taken off a charging station and taken anywhere in that day room. The phones are hard mounted to the wall and so they have to stand next to the phone, obviously have to stand next to the phone to make a phone call. So, you know. Do other agencies have the ability to edit or make changes to the, any, any of the information stored on these calls or video visits? No. How do you know the date and time a call was placed? Um, every time a f uh, phone call or a visit video visit it comes in, it is time stamped with the date and time that it that came in through the system. Lieutenant, at the state's request, did you access some calls and video visits made or received by Lori Vallow? Yes. Your Honor, if I could have uh, the witness handed what has been marked as States 33. Actually, Judge, I'm going to have them uh, handed 33. 34A and 34B. I see it. Thank you. We've talked about it. Lieutenant, I'm going to have you focus on what's been marked as States 33. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is it? It's a thumb drive containing a phone call from June 9th, 2020, between Chad and Lori Daybell. And how do you know that? I've reviewed and listened to this phone call. 
And specifically, have you reviewed that USB device? Yes. And have you initialed and dated when you reviewed it? Yes. Fair to say that you monitored a number of jail calls made between Lori Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell. Correct, yes. Uh, and you recognize uh, the number and the voice as the second party as Chad Daybell. Yes. And is it a true and accurate representation of a call that was made between Lori Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell in States Exhibit 33? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move to admit States 33. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. States Exhibit 33 is admitted. Uh, Lieutenant, I'm going to have you look now at sorry States. Sorry to interrupt. Just I'm sorry, Judge. A brief sidebar with counsel, please. All right, we just uh, had a brief sidebar. The court was just discussing the uh, admission and handling of digital files with counsel, so thank you for your attention on that, counsel. Apologies for my interruption, and you can continue with your examination, Mr. Rammel. Thank you, Judge. Lieutenant, I'm going to have you now look at what has been marked as State's Exhibit 34A. Do you recognize that? Yes. What do you recognize it to be? Um, it's a thumb drive containing a digital video visit between Summer Shiflet and Lori Vallow uh, on June 24th, 2020. And how do you know that? Um, this is the thumb drive I initialed and dated, and on the date I reviewed it, the phone call. And you have reviewed that call on that thumb drive? Yes. And is it a true and accurate representation of a call made between Lori Vallow, or excuse me, a video visit made between Lori Vallow and Summer Shiflet uh, on June 24th, 2020. Yes. Your Honor, the state would move to admit what has been marked as states 34A. Any objection? We have no objection to the admission of 34A if it uh, is what it purports to be. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. 34A is admitted. Lieutenant, I'm going to have you now look at what has been marked as State's Exhibit 34B. Do you recognize that? Yes. And what do you recognize that to be? Um, this is also a thumb drive containing a video visitation between uh, Lori Vallow, excuse me, Lori Vallow and uh, Colby Ryan on August 3rd, 2020. And how do you know? Uh, this is the same thumb drive that I dated and initialed after listening and reviewing the video visit. And is that a true and accurate representation of a video visit made between Lori Vallow Daybell and Colby Ryan on 8 24, 2020? Yes. The state would move or to eight, admit. 8 August 3rd, 2020. I'm sorry, August 3rd, 2020. Yeah. Thank you, Lieutenant. All right, the state's moved to admit Exhibit 34B. Is there any objection from the defense? Uh, no objection to 34B, Your Honor, if it, if it is what it purports to be. Okay, Exhibit 34B then is admitted. And then can I be handed back uh, State's Exhibit 33, please? Oh, 33. Lieutenant. You testified in State's Exhibit 33. Uh, it was a call made between Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell on June 9th, 2020. Uh, does that date catch your attention? Yes. What catches your attention about it? Uh, that was the date that a search was made out at Chad Daybell's property, and when it, the search was um, conducted and and the bodies of JJ and Taylor were found. And you were made aware of it that morning? Yes. Your Honor, I would request that we publish States 33 to the jury. Any objection to that being published? No, Your Honor. All right, Exhibit 33 may be published to the jury.
This is a call from and paid for by Lori. An inmate at Madison County Jail. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. If you don't wish to talk, hang up now. Thank you for using Tellmate. No. Are you okay? No, they're searching three. Three. The house area? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna miss. So Mark means we'll be talking to you. They call from and Your Honor, that's all I have for Lieutenant Wilmer. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Rammel. Any cross examination for this witness? No cross, Your Honor. All right, uh, Lieutenant Wilmore, that will conclude your testimony. Thank you for appearing this morning, and you can be excused. All right, the state can call its next uh, witness. Uh, the state now calls Joe Powell. Mr. Powell, if you'd just come forward, pause, and raise your right hand, I'll have you placed under oath by the clerk. All 
All right, Officer Powell, follow the directions of the bailiff there. All right, I'll just remind the witness we're keeping a stenographic record of the proceedings, so please answer verbally using yes or no, for example. Please also try to avoid talking at the same time as anyone that's asking you a question. With that in mind, then, uh, also I'll have the state, uh, Ms. Rawlings, please identify yourself on the record before we get started, and you can commence with your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. I am Tanya Rawlings with the Fremont County Prosecutor's Office. All right, you can inquire on direct. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, um, as we discussed earlier, I do have uh, some certified records for medical documents and a, also a certified copy of the exhumation order for Tammy Daybell's body. Um, they are marked as exhibits 38 through 41, I believe. And I think based on prior stipulation, I'm moving for their admission at this time. So this is exhibits 38, 39, 40, and 41, correct? Correct, Your Honor. Okay, individually I'll call those out then. They've all been offered. Is there any objection to the admission of exhibit 38? No, Your Honor. Any objection to admitting exhibit 39? Your Honor, I apologize. If we can go back to 38. Um, it's on, on the business record itself. On the front of it, it says Exhibit 83. And on the back of it, it says 38. Is that what you have? I do. There's uh, lined out. Looks like previously marked sticker. Um, I don't have, I have a courtesy copy, so mine doesn't have the currently marked trial sticker, but it probably is worth Clarifying on the record the number and the uh, explanation of a sticker on page one. Uh, yes, it was used in a prior proceeding, Your Honor. And so the the, pr the sticker on the front is, is not the correct sticker. The sticker on the back of the page is the correct one. Okay, and that would be Exhibit 38, correct, which is a, it's entitled Business Records Certification of Teton Medical Group? Correct. Okay. Any objection now if that clarified, Mr. Thomas? No, Your Honor, I, I was just concerned that maybe there was a dyslexic uh, type a moment, but I think we're good. <laughs> All right. Um, on Exhibit 39, does the defense have any objection to its admission? No, Your Honor. On Exhibit 40, it's been offered. Any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor. Exhibit 41 has also been offered. Any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. Each of those exhibits is now admitted into the record of the trial. You can commence with your examination then, Ms. Rawlings. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Lieutenant Powell, would you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Joseph Powell, P-O-W-E-L-L. -L. Where do you currently work? Fremont County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed with them? 21 years. What is your current job title? Lieutenant. Do you have any specialized training in order to be a peace officer? Yes, you have to attend the Idaho uh, Police Academy, and then they require uh, 40 continuous continuing hours within every two years. Do you have any additional training to be a lieutenant? Yes. And what training and experience do you have as a lieutenant? I've been a lieutenant for six years, and... Um, a hundred plus hours of training. Okay. And as a lieutenant, what are some of your job duties? I'm over patrol, the detectives, I oversee the schedule, uh, look at reports, cover patrol shifts, and help detectives as needed. Um, have you worked as a detective in the past? Yes. How long did you work as a detective? Approximately four and a half years. Are part of your current duties to investigate and follow up on cases? Yes. If detectives need help or uh, they're busy, then I'll take a case or two. 
In your current role, are you informed of unattended deaths in Fremont County? Yes. Did you learn of the death of Tamara Daybell? Yes. When did you learn of her death? On uh, October 19th, 2019. Okay. And in addition to that, were you also contacted by another law enforcement agency regarding her death? Yes. Who was that? Gilbert, Gilbert Police Department in Arizona. Okay. When did they contact you? Uh, on October 31st, 2019. What did you learn from that contact? The, they was inquiring about Tammy's death and if we was investigating it, and um, they had an attempted murder down there. At some point, did you become aware of an individual or of an investigation involving someone named Lori Vallow? Yes. Did you also learn about an individual named Alex Cox? Yes. And did you also learn about an individual named Chad Dado? Yes. Um, did the Gilbert Police Department request your assistance? Yes, they did. What did they request your assistance with? Trying to locate a 2018 Jeep Wrangler, gray in color, with Texas plates. Did you personally follow up on looking for the Jeep? Yes. Where did you initially attempt to locate the Jeep? Uh, went to the 202 North, 1900 East in Fremont County. And what residence is that? The Chad Daybell residence. Okay. Why did you follow up on this? Uh, it was just quick and easy. Detectives was busy. So I just got in my vehicle and drove out there and checked. Okay. Um, did you conduct additional surveillance when you were looking for the Jeep? Yes. Where did you conduct that additional surveillance? Uh, 565 Pioneer Road in Rexburg. And how, if at all, did that connect to the death of Tammy Daybell? Uh, Chad Daybell was um, at that residence with uh, that residence there. Okay. Um, what, if anything else, about your conversation with Arizona caused you concern over Tammy's death? Uh, about the death surrounding um, the individuals and the attempted murder. Okay. Was there anything that caused you concern specifically with the names Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell being connected? Yeah, the same with the deaths and uh, attempted murder. Were you involved in surveilling Chad and Lori? Yes. How so? Uh, we surveilled them to a few different locations. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed uh, State's Exhibits 35 and 36 at this time. And I believe the court and defense has courtesy copies. Can I take a look at those just to make sure they're the same as my courtesy copy? All right, with respect to Exhibit 35, do you recognize this document, Lieutenant Powell? Yes. How are you able to recognize it? I was sitting at that table when the photo was taken. And when was that photograph taken? Uh, November 1st, 2019. Okay. Does it fairly and accurately depict the scene as you saw it on the day that it was taken? Yes. Are there any material alterations to that photograph? No. Your Honor, I'm moving for the admission of uh, State's Exhibit 35. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 35 is admitted. And uh, turning your attention to Exhibit 36, Lieutenant Powell, do you recognize that document? Yes. How are you able to recognize it? This was uh, on that same day. And can you tell us the date again? Uh, November 1st, 2019. And does it fairly and accurately depict uh, the scene as you observed it that day? Yes. Are there any material alterations to the photograph? No. 
Your Honor, I also move for the admission of Exhibit uh, 36, excuse me. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 36 is admitted. And Your Honor, may I um, have those exhibits back to publish them to the jury? You may. All right, and I think this is the third time that I've asked you this question, but when did you observe Chad and Lori at Cafe Rio? November 1st, 2019. And this picture uh, depicts that? Yes. And do you, uh, what were your observations of them while they were at Cafe Rio? Uh, is it in conversation and eating? Okay. Uh, where else did you observe Chad and Lori? Uh, walking in the Hobby Lobby. Okay, and does this uh, picture uh, show that? Yes, it does. Okay, and what did you observe about their behavior with each other? They was holding hands as, as they was walking in. Okay. At some point, uh, was an investigation into Tammy's death conducted? Yes. Why? Because of um, all the suspicious circumstances, the investigation, um, her age. Okay. Um, you mentioned her age. Were there any other uh, suspicious circumstances that you'd elaborate on? Uh, through the investigation, uh, uh, it seemed that she was in pretty good health. Okay. And was this a joint investigation with other agencies? Yes, it was. What other agencies were involved at this point? Uh, Rexburg Police Department, the Sheriff's Office, and I believe the FBI was too. At some point, did you turn this investigation over to detectives in the Fremont County Sheriff's Office? Yes. Is that a common practice? Yes. How is that decided? Uh, it's just decided on uh, between by me, the sheriff, or the chief deputy, and uh, depending on the caseload and what's going on. Okay. What did you do specifically in relation to the investigation involving Tammy's death? Uh, I did a search warrant on the townhomes in Rexburg, on one townhome in Rexburg, um, and then I helped with the search warrant at the Davo residence and uh, the exclamation of Tammy Davo. Okay. Now, with regard to the search warrant for the townhomes in Rexburg, the one specifically you did, were you able to determine who was on the lease? Yes. Who was that? Alex Cox. Do you recall the number? 175. Okay. Um, did you also seek search warrants for uh, Tammy Daybell's medical records? Yes, I did. And what did you learn from your review of those records? That uh, she didn't go to the doctor very often. She was in uh, good health. She was being seen for depression and uh, her hand. Okay. Um, do you recall from your review of those medical re records anything regarding her heart or blood pressure? No, I'm going to object. I don't think he has the, the uh, qualifications to be commenting on medical records. At this point, I will sustain that objection. I think that's probably outside of the scope of proper testimony for this witness. Did you run a controlled uh, prescription check or seek a search warrant for Tammy's prescriptions? Yes. What did you learn from your review of the prescription records? Again, Your Honor, I'm not sure he can uh, testify as to review of prescription medical records. It's the same thing. Well, he, he can talk about what 
he saw in review of the records what that means is probably outside the scope of any expertise he may have, but you can answer that question, uh, and I'll probably have Madam Prosecutor read the question again at this point. Okay. And, um, and I'll maybe lay a little bit more foundation, Your Honor, too. Thank you. As part of uh, your duties as law enforcement, are you able to run um, control, controlled substance checks for uh, people's prescriptions? Yes. And that's a database that you have access to as a member of law enforcement? Yes. And so you're able to verify whether someone has a prescription for a controlled substance? Yes. All right. And then in addition to that check in this case, you also did get a warrant for her prescriptions from Walmart. Is that correct? Yes. And in checking that, just asking what you observed or what you saw in terms of the prescriptions she was provided. She was prescribed uh, fluoxetine and tramadol. Okay. Uh, based on that, did that cause you any additional concern? Yes. What was that? Your Honor, I apologize, but if he's going to start talking about uh, fluoxetine or tramadol, I'm going to have an objection. I don't think he's qualified to speak on those things. I don't think there's been proper foundation as to his qualifications as a pharmacist and or medical doctor. All right. There is a uh, pending objection. I think certainly the officers got the foundation here in the training to review what prescriptions were um, in terms of what those may mean in a medical sense, I think would be outside the scope of proper testimony. So there hasn't been a response yet, but with that in mind, Madam Prosecutor, you can continue to inquire. Okay. Um, as a result of your investigation, was a decision made to exhume Tamara Daybell's body? Yes. What facts for you played into the decision to exhume her? Uh, she was healthy, her age, there was no uh, sign of heart or blood pressure. Um, and with... Um, Again, Your Honor, I'm going to object. He's now talking about her medical uh, diagnoses. That's overruled. You can continue to answer. And uh, with her husband being with the, another lady so soon after. Okay. And what role did you play in the process for exhuming her body? I got a court order from Utah. And was that signed by a judge? Yes, it was. Where, where was her body located? Springfield, Utah. Okay. Um, were you present for the exhumation? Yes. And, Your Honor, at this time, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed uh, exhibits, states exhibits 37A through 37H. All right, the witness will be provided those exhibits. And, um, Lieutenant, can you just review those quickly? I apologize, Your Honor. Before he answers, may I take a look at those just to make sure they conform to what, what I have? Yes. Thank you. Your Honor. And just to speed things along, I have no objection to the admission of any of those. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Thomas. So they're being offered, I assume, Ms. Rawlings? Yes, Your Honor. And if um, there's no objection, I'd move for their admission and to publish to the jury. Okay. I will uh, then put on the record exhibits 37A, B, C, D, E, F, 
G and H have all been admitted and may be published to the jury. And Lieutenant Powell, in uh, your review of those photos, were they, um, I think I may have already asked you this, but in case I didn't, were you present for the exhumation? Yes, I was. Okay. And um, I'm just going to walk you through this, and maybe it's better to see. So in looking at, in looking at State's Exhibit 37A, what does that depict? Uh, Tammy Daybell's grave. And off to the right-hand side, you can see the backhoe, a little bit of it. And 37B? The backhoe digging the grave up. Thirty seven C. The vault being lifted out of the ground. Thirty seven D. The vault outside the ground. And what is what material is the vault made of? Cement. Thirty seven E. The vault being open, showing the top of the casket. And thirty seven F. Inside the vault with the casket removed. Thirty seven G. The casket being loaded into the vehicle to be transported. Okay. Where was her body taken? To the medical examiner's office in Utah. And were you present when the coffin was opened? Yes, I was. Did you know Tammy Daybell prior to this investigation? No, I did not. Were you able to identify the remains of Tammy Daybell? Yes. How? From photographs. And uh, 37H is being published to the jury at this time. Was uh, Tammy's body still in a condition that you could identify it, identify it based on those pictures that you'd reviewed? Yes. Was there any indication that the body or the casket had been tampered with in any manner? No. And what did you see inside the casket? Tammy Daybell's body. Okay. Were you present for the autopsy? Yes, I was. Was there a determination as to the cause of death at that time? No, there was not. Following the autopsy, what happened with regard to Tammy's body? She was taken to a funeral home and then prepared and then taken back out and reburied. Once the autopsy was concluded, were there any other actions taken in relation to that investigation? Uh, yes, from the other detectives. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to turn your attention to January 3rd of 2020. Were you working that day? Yes, I was. What was your assignment that day? To help serve a search warrant. Where did you serve the search warrant? 202 North, 1900 East in Fremont County, Idaho. And uh, what type of building is that? It's a single family dwelling. Okay. And whose residence is it or dwelling is it? Chad Davils. Were any other agencies involved in the service of that search warrant on January 3rd? 2020. Yes, Rexburg detectives, FBI, FBI ERT team, and the uh, Fremont County Sheriff's Office. Did they collect? Fremont County Sheriff's Office. Did they collect evidence? Yes. 
Um, at the end of the search warrant, were items uh, found in the home turned over to you? Yes. Do you recall who turned those items over to you? The FBI ERT team. And where was this again? Uh, 202 North, 1900 East in Fremont County. And how were the items packaged? In evidence packaging. What did you do with those items? Loaded the items in my vehicle and Detective Mattingly's vehicle. Okay. And after loading those items, where were they transported? The Fremont County Sheriff's Office. After arriving at the Sheriff's Office, did you uh, turn possession of those items, all those items, over to another officer? Yes, to Detective Bruce Mattingly. Okay. And uh, were you involved in booking any of that evidence? No, I was not. Okay. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rowlings. Uh, Cross-examination from the defense. Is the court wanting to take a mid-morning break any time? I mean, just kind of give me kind of a ballpark as to when you want me to. I was thinking around 1030, but any time. Okay, I think I could probably be done by then. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Morning, Officer Powell. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. So I want to talk a little bit uh, about a couple of things. Um, you work for the Fremont County Sheriff's Office currently? Yes. Okay. Have you ever worked for any other agencies? No. Okay. Um, you were contacted by the Gilbert Police Department in, in Arizona, is that right? Yes. With regards to locating a Jeep? Yes. Okay. And from that, you were involved in some surveillance of Chad Debo and Lori, Lori Vallow, is that right? Yes. Okay. And you took some, some photos. Uh, I believe one was at Cafe Rio. Do you know where that was? Was that in Fremont County or Madison County or somewhere else? That was in Bonneville County. Bonneville County? Yes. And um, how far is that from uh, from St. Anthony's? So your office is in St. Anthony, is that right? Yes, it is. And this photograph was taken in Idaho Falls, is that right? Yes. So how far of a drive, if you were to drive, how, how far is that? Approximately 30 minutes. Okay. And your normal jurisdiction is... Fremont County, but you indicate in this particular case that you've served a search warrant or, or was the primary on a search warrant in Madison County, correct? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. I apologize. Maybe I maybe I got some things mixed up. You were not on the search warrant of the townhomes in Rexburg? No. I... If I did, I just assisted. I was not primary on it. Okay. You didn't testify to anything about search warrants in the townhomes in Rexburg? I served a search warrant to see who was on the lease for the townhomes, yes. Okay. And those townhomes are located in what county? Rexburg. Madison? Madison County, yes. Okay. All right. And you indicated that Alex Cox was on the lease at, at 175? Yes. Okay. But you weren't involved in, in uh, actually searching that townhome? Uh, I don't recall, but if I was, it was just assisting Rexburg PD. Okay. But you don't have any specific recollection of being there when that, when that cert, when, when those townhomes were searched? I, I don't. Okay. All right. As far as your surveillance goes uh, of Lori and, and Chad Daybell, how, 
How many times did you surveil them? Just that one day. Oh, just the one time. Okay. Yeah. Um, and did you follow them to their location from Fremont or Madison County? Yes. And which one? From Madison County. Okay. And, and where in Madison County did you follow them from? 565 Pioneer Road. Okay. So where were you, were, were you uh, doing kind of like a stakeout or something at that particular area? Yes. Okay. And how long had you been there before you saw Chad and Lori? I don't recall how long we've been there. Half an hour, more than half an hour? I'd say at least a half an hour. Okay. Uh, and then you followed them uh, down to Idaho Falls? We followed them a few different places. But, yes, we did end up going to Idaho Falls. When you say we, who who is we? There was myself, Chief Deputy Thad Gardner, uh, Detective Stubbs, and I believe... Detective Hermosello was there for a little bit, but then he had to leave. Um, were, were you all four in the same car, or were you in different cars? Different vehicles. Okay. So you were the only one in your vehicle? Yes. Okay. And to your knowledge, uh, were, you, were you the only one who captured photographic evidence of, of this particular surveillance? No, there was uh, others that collected photos. Other photos that were taken on this day? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, when you were sitting in Cafe Rio, uh, did you happen to overhear any of the conversation between Chad and Lori? No. How far away were you? Uh, a, there was a table in between us. Okay. It didn't look like it was very busy. Were they talking at all? They appeared to be talking, yes. Okay, but you couldn't hear anything they were saying? Uh, not to my recollection, no. Okay. Were you involved at all in the October 9th um, investigation of the uh, attempted paintball shooting of Tammy Dayville? Your Honor, I'm going to object. This is beyond the scope. I'll overrule that. Go ahead and answer. No, I was not. Okay. Do you happen to know, you were involved in the investigation of Tammy Daybell's death, correct? Yes. I mean, obviously you went down to the exhumation and stuff. Yes. Are you aware of where Lori Vallow was when Tammy Daybell died on uh, October 19th? No. Okay. Would it surprise you to know that she was in Hawaii? No. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any redirect from the state? No, Your Honor. All right, that will conclude the testimony then of uh, Officer Powell. I think this will probably be a good time to take a mid-morning break. If I could just briefly meet with counsel at the beginning of break to review the day's schedule, we'll do that. And uh, all please rise for the jury then. All right, thank you. Thank you. Let me just uh, 
indicate also as we break for the morning break and at any other breaks, there's a couple of rooms that are reserved just outside the courtroom for council only. So if you're a member of the observing public, please don't make any entry into those rooms just outside the courtroom doors here. And with that in mind, we'll have our mid-morning break and I'll just briefly discuss our scheduling with council. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Please be seated. All right, Mr. Bailiff, and as soon as the jurors are ready, uh, they can be brought it back in. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on KCR 22-21-1624. The jurors are all present, states present as well as the defendant and her counsel. Uh, we just concluded our mid-morning break. Typically at this time we would commence with another 
witness. However, there's been some unforeseen circumstances that have required uh, the state to request that we adjourn for the day. We've discussed that in chambers, and I understand the defense would not object to that request given the circumstances as well. So does the state request an adjournment for the day? Yes, thank you. All right. Does the defense agree? Yes, that's fine, Your Honor. Okay. I appreciate that, counsel. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, occasionally these things come up during a long trial. We appreciate your attendance today. We will be adjourning for the day. I will also advise you that <clears throat> we have determined that we're going to need to take a day off, which would be next Monday the 17th. So uh, we'll be back on for trial tomorrow, Thursday the 13th, and Friday the 14th. And then uh, you will not be required to return on the 17th, and then we'll start again on the 18th. And I just thought I'd let you know in advance so you can make plans to do other things while you have that break uh, coming up this weekend. So that will conclude evidence for today. Uh, as I try to remember to tell you each time we break for the day, please continue to follow the admonishment of the court to not investigate this case. Don't look into the case through the internet or through any other media sources. Please don't discuss the case with anyone else, uh, including each other. And with that, if all would please rise, we'll have the jury excused for the day. All right. All right, thank you. We'll be adjourned until tomorrow morning. At Your Honor, I apologize. I just had one quick thing. Uh, may Joe Powell be released from his subpoena? Yes, uh, unless there's any objection from the defense. No objection. All right, Officer Powell is released from his subpoena. Thank you, counsel. We will uh, recommence tomorrow morning at 8.30. Thank you. All rise.